Professor Matthew Sakonikis. I'm a doctor of sacred theology, and I wanted to share some insights I think I had on the first message of Akita. A lot of a lot of press, a lot of attention is always given to the third secret from October 13th, but the July 6, 1973 message that was given to Sister Agnes Sasagawa, I think is really one that needs to be paid attention to the most. Uh, it's not as sensational, obviously, as the third one. But I wanted to draw attention to um, Sister Agnes and how much she actually was a victim soul, how she sacrificed herself through love of Jesus Christ to bring God's blessings and mercies onto this world. And since she passed away recently on August 15th, just a few days ago, I want to take the time to recognize her and ask people to pay more attention to the first message now. Yes, the third one is dramatic. I've certainly written on it many times. You can find, you can find that third message written uh, at my Substack at catholic460.substack.com. Uh, that goes into some of what happened in 1973 uh, with Sister Agnes. But uh, I think the main point we need to pay attention to, and so I wanted to share with you two quotes from Scripture that are relevant, and that first message from July 6th. And I'm doing this to, to honor Sister Agnes. And so I've, more recently, I've been having to offer up sufferings, as many of you who suffer various illnesses and the rest do, and where does this come from, this idea of joining Christ and our sufferings to complete what Jesus has asked us to complete for his mystical body? All of Jesus' sufferings were sufficient for all of us. Jesus suffered once for all, and yet Jesus wants us to enter into his life. He shares his life so that we can do what he does. There's only one mediator between God and man, that's Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ invites us. He's so powerful. He's so unafraid of glory being stolen from him. He knows his glory is seeing his life in us. And so he invites us to share in his life. He invites us to join him in his redemption. He invites us to join him in his mediation. He wants us to grow up to be like him in all ways. As St. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, that we must grow into him in every way. And how he tells us in Philippians chapter 2 that we must take on the mind of Christ and so enter into his sacrificial death, enter into his suffering, to not be afraid of suffering. And I think this really defines Sister Agnes and what the first message was about and what the real message of Akita was about. And I'm going to demonstrate it was actually trying to show us the meaning of Mary as co-redemptrix. And so I'm going to give you two quick scripture quotes here. The first one comes from Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. And I've got taped up on the side of my computer. It's probably the worst low-budget job ever for doing a little podcast. And I've got actually taped up. So you see my eyes moving to the left and to the right. I don't. I wish I had teleprompters, but they're actually taped over my monitor. And I can only see a little inch of my monitor here as I read these to you. Um, and so in Colossians, St. Paul says to us in chapter 1, verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. So in other words, there's nothing lacking in what Christ did or in his redemption. And yet Christ calls us to be through his Holy Spirit and subject to him and subordinate to him. He invites us to share in his sufferings so that we learn to offer our yes through his yes. Through his obedience to the will of the Father, he wants to help us learn to have his obedience so that what he did is not external to us, but internal to us. It actually belongs to us through him. So he's, ask, he's asking us to consolidate within ourselves his very virtues by learning to surrender our lives through him, with him, and in him, and St. Paul is saying that I, through Christ and the Holy Spirit living in me that Christ the head gives to me, I now am able to intercede for you and make intercessions that obtain graces for people who are living in disobedience. And Jesus has asked me to share in his redemption, to share in his sufferings, so that as Christ lives in me, and that's the mystery, Christ lives in us, 
the very mystery of Christ is presented again to the world through the baptized. Through those who have faith in Jesus, we present the mystery of Jesus to them, and it opens their hearts and obtains graces. And though many people will never even know of us, the sufferings we offer for them, it is through the sufferings of others through faith in Christ that the life of Christ continues to be shared in all who come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so listen again to what St. Paul said. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. So all that we go through through faith in Christ is working to not only free us from sin and help us learn to love by learning to say yes to God even when it hurts. The sacrifice we make has power from Jesus Christ because it's through faith in Jesus that we do it. And it gives the power that his life and graces are now extended and offered to others. He lets us actually share in his mediation. We are members of his mystical body and as members of his mystical body, what we do is shared with all who belong to Christ. It helps all who are weak. It helps all who might be suffering lack of faith. And it offers to all who are baptized but have fallen into sin opportunities to repent. And so it's by this mystery of Christ working through us and in us that he also shares his life. And so we add to that another quote. And this is from John chapter 14, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. Just meditate for a moment. The one who believes me will do the works that I do, and greater ones than these. Well, what was the greatest work Jesus did? Love. It's certainly love. And so he gave us the strength to love our enemies. He gave us the strength to pray for those who persecute us. He gave us the strength to learn to love as God loves, and that is to love others before they love us. That's what it means to learn how to love as God loves. It's not enough to just love God because he loves you, because now you're loving someone who already loves you. God loves us before we love him. And so he wants us to learn to love others before they love us. And this is what perfects love. And this is where our love enters in the likeness of God through faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus molds love in a new way that makes us partakers in the divine nature. And it's because of this power through faith in Jesus Christ that we actually possess, Jesus works in us and we do the works that Jesus did. And so just as Jesus' sufferings had value, so those of us who believe in Jesus, our sufferings have value. Our prayers call down graces for these people. Our lives call down graces for these people, not because it's the life of Matthew Sakonikis or Joe Smith, and forgive me, I know there's probably people named Joe Smith out there, but the point being, it's because Jesus is in me that what I do has power, because apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. He is the vine and I'm a branch. It's his life in me that gives value to what I do. I cannot merit Jesus' grace when I'm not in grace. The initial gift of grace is a totally free gift of God. I didn't merit it or earn it in any way. But because it's been given to me, it's been given to me to do the works of Christ, to be the extension of his mystical body. And so I want to take those two verses together. St. Paul says, I make up in my flesh the sufferings lacking um, in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the church. And Jesus himself saying, truly I say to you, he who believes in me will do the works I do and greater works than these because I go to the Father. And I want to apply that to the first message of Sister Agnes Sasagawa of the Handmaids of the Eucharist. And so I want to look at in the very first message. In the first message, um, she has received already a wound in her hand, the stigmata, and it's in her left hand. And she's been having visions of the tabernacle and light coming out of the tabernacle and seeing angels work, worship our Eucharistic Lord Jesus Christ present in the tabernacle, all the tabernacles throughout the world, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And there's a statue there. There's a statue that's from Amsterdam, Our Lady of All Nations. And that's the statue that actually wept tears 101 times. It's a statue that was approved by the local bishop, Bishop John Edo, declaring in the early 1980s these events to be worthy of belief of supernatural origin in this private revelation that took place. 
And so uh, at this first message that was coming in July 6th, she already had in her left hand in the form of a cross, the stigmata and it was bleeding and it was causing her pain. Um, and leading up to the message, there was that statue there of Our Lady of All Nations. And it was a statue in which the message was very clearly restating how Mary's the new Eve. And so as emphasized because she's the new Eve, she also partakes subordinate to Jesus, subject to Jesus, only through Jesus by being the Immaculate Conception, that she also is one who partakes in Christ and Christ gives value to her works. And so this is what we mean when we call her mediatrix, advocate, and co-redemptrix. And that's what I want to pay attention to. This mystery of Jesus inviting us to become sons in him. Romans chapter 8, how we become, through the Holy Spirit, sons of God, through the gift of Jesus Christ. And so since that son of God obtained redemption for us, we who believe in him continue his work. And because he empowers it, we bring redemption to others and we mediate graces to others, as Basil the Great discusses in his doctrine on the Holy Spirit, how those in the Holy Spirit mediate the Holy Spirit to others. And so when, when the Virgin Mary um, was giving messages, uh, the Virgin Mary, actually in the statue, you saw in the right hand of the statue, there was a stigmata in which it was shown as though the Virgin Mary was also participating in Christ's sufferings. And the statue represented that. And so when the Virgin Mary appeared and took over where the statue was, uh, she gave a message that speaks of offering our sufferings to God and how we obtain graces for sinners and how we help the church by praying for church leaders and praying for the members of the mystical body. And so what we have to look at is, Notice how the Virgin Mary on her right hand had the stigmata in the statue and how Sister Agnes had the stigmata on her left hand. What's it telling us? It's telling us that the Virgin Mary was inviting Sister Agnes to join her at the foot of the cross because the statue of all nations, Our Lady of Akita is the statue of Our Lady of all nations. There's a cross behind her, which means the Virgin Mary is at the foot of the cross making intercession for sinners. And so what the statue was trying, the statue was symbolizing and what was attempting to be shown to us is the mystery of how the Virgin Mary continues to make intercession for us because the Virgin Mary represents the mystery of the faithful spouse of Jesus Christ, which is the church. So what she was reminding Sister Agnes is, yes, I am the sign and symbol and archetype of the church. I am the I am the first to belong to Jesus Christ, the first redeemed of Jesus Christ. But you also who are baptized, you are redeemed of Jesus Christ. Uh, Mary was redeemed in a unique way. We are redeemed from, ever, from being touched by original sin. She was redeemed by Christ without ever being touched by original sin. And she's saying to us, she who is the archetype of the church is saying to the rest of those who receive the imprint from the archetype who also become members of the church as the Virgin Mary is member of the church, she's inviting Sister Agnes to join her in making intercession for sinners, not by Sister Agnes' own power, but by the power given to us through our baptism and partic participating in the Eucharist. The life of Christ reigns in us. And so we do what Christ Jesus said to us. He who believes in me will do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. We can only do the works of Christ because Christ lives in us. And so whatever we do gives glory to Jesus Christ. It doesn't steal from his mediation. It doesn't take away from him being the one mediator between God and man. He shares and lets us share in that mediation just as he lets us share in his sonship. To share in his sonship is to share in his mediation. Now listen to the message the Virgin Mary gave and understand how, how these very apparitions were confirming that Mary is rightly called co-redemptrix, not because she was equal to Jesus in any way in the redemption, but as the church has always called her co-redemptrix. Pius XI referred to her as co-redemptrix at least five times in the ordinary magisterium of the church. Vatican II's Lumen Gentium teaches uh, clearly that she participated in the redemption through the Annunciation and standing at the foot of the cross making, making intercession, sharing in Christ's sufferings as she gave him the very flesh and blood that was being offered for us on the cross. And so in this very first message, hear the Virgin Mary 
inviting all the church to be like her and to make intercession for sinners, including ourselves. Whenever we're making intercession, we're making intercession for ourselves who are still being sanctified. We've received the unmerited gift of redemption, of sanctifying grace. But now that we have sanctifying grace in us, where before we couldn't merit it, now that we do have sanctifying grace in us, we can merit an increase in this by practicing the obediences God gives us. And the obedience God gives us is sufferings. To accept our sufferings and say, I'm sorry for my sins and I offer and accept this suffering, Lord, for the forgiveness for you to continue to free me from my sinfulness and free my brothers and sisters from their sinfulness. And just as Jesus made that intercession for us, he asked us to make that intercession for one another. Again, he who believes in me will do the works I do and greater ones than these will he do because I go to the Father. This is what glorifies Jesus, that we learn to love as Jesus loved. And so she says, listen to this first message of July 6, the Virgin Mary appearing as co-redemptrix. That's what the statue represented from Our Lady of All Nations apparitions in Amsterdam. Co-redemptrix as subordinate and subject to Jesus as one redeemed by Jesus. And she says, quote, my daughter, my novice, you have obeyed me well in abandoning all to follow me. Is the infirmity of your ears painful? Your deafness will be healed, be sure. Does the wound of your hand cause you to suffer? Pray in reparation for the sins of men. Each person in this community is my irreproachable daughter. Do you say well the prayer of the handmaids of the Eucharist? Then let us pray it together. And here's the prayer they prayed together. Most sacred heart of Jesus, truly present in the Holy Eucharist, I consecrate my body and soul to be entirely one with your heart, being sacrificed at every instant on all the altars of the world, and giving praise to the Father, pleading for the coming of his kingdom. Please receive this humble offering of myself. Use me as you will for the glory of the Father and the salvation of souls. Most Holy Mother of God, never let me be separated from your divine Son. Please defend and protect me as your special child. Amen. So why was it Sister Agnes had a wound of the stigmata, the wound of Christ in her left hand? And the Virgin Mary had the wound of Christ in her right hand. She was trying to say, look, Sister Agnes, you are continuing what all the members of Jesus' mystical body must do. And since I was the first member of his body, I'm not the head, I'm the member of his body. And I was at the foot of the cross at Jesus' sacrifice, offering and praying, joining my heart, which was full of the Holy Spirit through the Immaculate Conception with his heart. And because Jesus willed it, through him, with him, and in him, I was meriting for all those who would become my sons and daughters, and you, Sister Agnes, are my daughter. But we're also members of the same body. We're all redeemed only through Jesus Christ. And so I'm asking you to continue that intercession, accepting all the sufferings that God gives you and offering them for the salvation of mankind because the world is in great sinfulness. And so the apparition then ended with, when the prayer was finished, the heavenly voice said to her, pray very much for the Pope, bishops, and priests. Since your baptism, you have always prayed faithfully for them. Continue to pray very much, very much. Tell your superior all that passed today and obey him in everything that he will tell you. He has asked that you pray with fervor. And that's the end of the July 6th first message. And it's so powerful because what it's doing was a call for the whole world to enter into prayer and sacrifice, prayer and fasting, to to join with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that living in me gives me the strength to make intercession for others. I share now, subject to Christ, subordinate to Christ, in his mediation. And so by making me a share in his work, his work develops in me the very virtues that all work develops. And so in doing Christ's work, I develop the virtues of a son of God, whether I'm male or female. It's the mystery of entering into his relationship with the Father by entering into his most important work, and that's the surrender of our will in obedience, loving what God only wills our good. And through sinfulness, uh, death and sin has entered this world, and it's a part of our lives, 
And so we humbly have to accept it. We pray to be free from it, just as Jesus said, Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. We also do likewise, but we also offer that suffering for the salvation of mankind. And so we bring the sign of Christ onto earth and call down God's graces through us to others. And the only reason we can do that is because Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. It all flows from him. It glorifies him. Now, um, that means this whole apparition was re-emphasizing the mystery that we're all co-redeemers, subordinate and subject to Christ. He's asked us to do the works that he does in order to develop us and his, and his grace and life to develop inside of us, bringing us from the image of God into the likeness of a greater likeness. Because just like a light can be turned on even brighter, the image of God becomes even brighter in us. We participate more fully in his love the more we learn to enter and abide in how he loves. And that's loving others before they even love us, when they haven't even done anything for us. And that's what it means to offer your sufferings for sinners, people you don't even know. And so you're becoming more like Christ, and he's forming his mystical body. And so you notice how much he said, pray for the priests, the bishops, the pope, because it was after the Second Vatican Council, and it was difficult implementing the council. Much confusion was entering into the world, and the, and the church was, was struggling in this new world after World War II to bring back Jesus Christ, the light of all nations, into the world. And that's why she was asking for those prayers. And I think that's where the third secret has to be contextualized or the third message that was so dramatic about this, that God was going to send chastisements unless men repent and, and the right. So the first message was enter into these prayers to bring people to repentance so this doesn't have to take place. Now, because of that wound in her left hand, um, they had just moved from, it used to always be communion on, on the tongue to communion in the hand. And because of the wound in her left hand, it was also viewed that she should start receiving, because it didn't feel good to put things in her hand, that she should start receiving again on the tongue. And the sisters began receiving again on the tongue. And so it was discerned by the director and those leading her that because this was such a novel thing to receive in the hand, that it was showing the importance of receiving on the tongue. You don't have to receive only on the hand. Now, in no way did the Virgin Mary ever condemn that the church permitted receiving in the hand. But receiving on the hand wasn't, I don't think, was supposed to actually become a norm. I agree with people who think that maybe it wasn't the smartest thing to do this. Just because there were mentions in some of the writings of the church fathers that uh, some early Christians received on the hand, uh, this, this was not the norm. Yes, in the beginning, people were receiving on the hand, but as we had to learn to teach people that this great mystery is actually the real, true, and substantial body and blood of Christ, the practice of receiving only on the tongue helped teach people to remember the mystery more easily because you're receiving it in a unique way, only on the tongue. And so it helped us remember transubstantiation better. I, I think people need to be careful and not get too caught up in saying that if we just fix certain things, like whether you receive on the hand or on the tongue, that will cause everything to be better in the church. That wasn't the main point that was going on here in any way in Akita. Don't get distracted. The main message was the great message here that we find in Scripture on how Jesus is asking us to enter into his work. So while I agree that it is important to encourage people and have the practices of receiving on the tongue, if they feel they want to receive on the hand, in no way should they be forbidden because the church permits this. So I just wanted to put that out there a little bit and uh, ask people not to get too caught up in those issues. Um, I want them to stay focused on this very message. And here's where I'm going to demonstrate now to you that the real message was recognizing that the Virgin Mary was co-redemptrix. And so um, the Blessed Virgin Mary in her message had told Sister Agnes that her director would help her and help her understand what was happening. And so it was her spiritual director when it came to why did the statue um, have the blood in its hand showing the union with the suffering of Christ on the cross? Why did the statue cry tears 101 times that were even tested in labs and proven to be of human origin and that there was no hoax going on? And the spiritual director was clear. Well, the guardian angel first explained it. Her guardian angel explained, and, and not only did he teach her the prayer of Fatima, oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy, um, connecting this with Fatima. The angel also taught her uh, that the 101 meant, it was a showing Mary's the new Eve, that on the number 101, 
The first one represents the first Eve. The zero represents the one eternal God, also signifying the mystery of him becoming flesh. And then the one on the other side shows how Mary played a subordinate role as the first Eve led to our downfall. So the new Eve, the new uh, woman, Mary, ever virgin, mother of God, she assisted Jesus, subordinate to him, through the grace and office he assigned her. She's not equal to him. And so it's showing and proclaiming her co-redemptrix. And so the spiritual director said to her, he said that uh, this was given, this was given to her, and I'm going to look for this quote real quickly. He said, the weeping and bleeding of the statue were brought about by God in order to illustrate the truth of Mary's role as co-redemptrix, end quote. And so we see that tie once again to the first message. The statue, which, which was part of an apparition, asking the world to properly remember how Mary was involved as the new Eve, represented by uh, Genesis, the promise of Genesis of a Redeemer in Genesis chapter 3, that it would come through the seed of the woman, that, that, this, that the seed of the woman and the woman would crush the head of the serpent, and so you have the woman, the Messiah, and the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. And then in Revelation chapter 12, you have the woman, the Messiah, and the serpent in the war, showing Mary is the one who gave birth to the Messiah, and therefore Mary is the true Eve that we awaited. And so that first message is pointing to Mary's the new Eve, that is new Eve, she participates in Christ's mediation in a unique way. She's our advocate in a unique way. And she's co-redemptrix in a unique way because she is the archetype of the church. And therefore, what the, what the one who is the first member of the church, not the head, Jesus is the head of the church, the, what the, fir the, the first member of the church imprints on all of us to also share in mediatrix, advocate, co-redemptrix. And this is how with Christ, we continue to bring his life into the world. And so think one more time on those quotes that I gave you. Colossians chapter 1, St. Paul said, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. And Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, verse 12, Truly I say to you, he who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. Well, that defines Sister Agnes in her flesh. She suffered deafness. She suffered stigmata. She suffered suffering. She suffered tumors. She suffered so many things. She suffered people um, disavowing her, people rejecting her, people misunderstanding her. And she offered all these sufferings up for the church. She was an obedient member of the church. She practiced poverty, chastity, and obedience as a religious she sought Christ with all of her heart. And we, need, we all should honor her with how she's all called us back of what it means to faithfully take up our cross and follow Christ and enter into the Eucharistic liturgy more fully. And that Eucharistic liturgy is where we, the baptized, are sharing in Christ's life. And now he wants to build his life more deeply into us through his resurrected body and blood being brought to us under the appearance of bread and wine. And so we, the baptized, are being joined to his sacrifice. And we're taking all of our sacrifices and being offered through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. And we say amen, which means please let my little contribution, which is not needed, it's not necessary, but which God is using to ask me to share in Christ's work, so that through the Holy Spirit given to me, I can develop the virtues of Christ and the image of God in me can become the likeness of God because I'm sharing in God's divinity. As St. Peter says, we become partakers in the divine nature, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. And so this is a little bit of a thank you to Sister Agnes for teaching us all what it means to accept our sufferings and to offer them to the Lord Jesus Christ. To be more focused on this first message, even though the third one is very dramatic and I certainly encourage people to read it. And so I invite you to, for us to all offer our sacrifices for one another. If you wanna read a little bit more on the third secret, want a little bit more on co-redemptrix, please go to the substack at catholic460.substack.com and find the articles in which I talk about the miraculous medal showing us the meaning of co-redemptrix, where I talk about another article 
from Mother of God to co-redemptrix. Certainly there's a Catholic World Report article for me from years ago that talks about from Fatima to Vatican II. Um, Mary is mother of the church and co-redemptrix. So uh, these are certain things that I've put down that share in the same themes you see in this video. And so I wish you all uh, life in Jesus Christ. Glory to Jesus Christ now and forever.